Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. And so um, I will try to get started on this. So um, today I'll be giving a talk about some of the work that I did recently on utilizing a food knowledge graph for healthy ingredient substitutions, um, which was work that was conducted together with, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if uh, the slides are showing up right now. Oh, okay, I can see it now. One moment, I'll be returning to the first slide. Okay, so sorry. Uh, so I'll be giving a talk about this work that I did uh, together with some of my uh, colleagues at RPI and IBM that are listed here. So um, this work was conducted as part of the Health Empowerment by Analytics, Learning, and Semantics, or HEALS project, uh, which broadly is trying to use computational methods to help people understand and improve their health conditions. My focus in particular has been on improving eating habits and nutritional intake from food and doing this sort of work uh, with the goal of getting towards more context-aware and personalized health applications. So um, let's consider a motivating example that kind of got us into trying to think about this thing of uh, ingredient substitutions. So let's think about, uh, we have, for example, a diabetic patient, and maybe he likes to eat mashed potatoes very much. Well, diabetic patients uh, generally are recommended to reduce their carbohydrate intake because that helps with uh, controlling their blood sugar levels. And potatoes are an ingredient that are very high in carbs. Now, rather than just saying, oh, you should never eat mashed potatoes again, which you like eating very much because it's unhealthy for you, perhaps we could instead suggest a very common alternative to this, which is a mashed cauliflower. Cauliflower are a very low carb alternative. And so if we could uh, be able to do work to be able to identify this aspect of one, potatoes are unhealthy for you, cauliflower is healthy for you, and then being able to automatically suggest this uh, substitution, perhaps we could work towards a system that can help to uh, automatically perform ingredient substitutions to make uh, familiar favorite recipes for people healthier in some way. And in our work for thinking about ingredient substitutions, uh, we considered the following aspects for trying to determine whether or not something was good as well as whether or not something is healthy. So we felt that good substitutions tend to be similar in some aspects. So the first is some qualitative properties such as their flavor and texture and such. And these are uh, types of properties that aren't generally explicitly captured in any way. You don't really have too many recipes that are are saying, oh, this ingredient is sweet, this ingredient is crunchy, and so on. And so we sort of needed to develop some sort of proxy to capture this information. Another aspect in which some substitutions are similar is uh, the type of ingredient. So for example, uh, different root vegetables, such as potatoes and carrots, oftentimes are interchangeable in some recipes. Or for example, cruciferous vegetables, which would be like cauliflower and broccoli. Those are also often interchangeable in recipes. Now. This aspect of uh, similarity in the type of ingredient is relevant, but it also would limit us a little bit in trying to find substitutions that aren't extremely similar in uh, the classification of their ingredient. And the last aspect of similarity that we wanted to look at for good substitutions was that they're used in similar recipes. Uh, recipes on the web probably would have a lot of examples of mashed potatoes versus recipes that are entirely focused on mashed cauliflower. And so we would want to be looking at uh, the context of the surrounding ingredients and the type of recipe it is to try to identify those kinds of similarities. Now, when we're thinking about whether or not substitutions are healthy, those can have some slightly clearer criteria. Uh, we particularly were looking into the nutritional content of ingredients. So for example, comparing a substitution of potatoes to cauliflower and saying cauliflower is more healthy for this person because it has lower carbohydrates. Another aspect of health uh, that we were able to consider is also uh, removing prohibited types of ingredients. So for example, if uh, someone's a vegetarian, if you wanted to find a substitution for some other ingredient, then something that's a type of meat would obviously be an unhealthy substitution uh, option in that example. So having thought about how we want to approach what our idea of good substitutions and healthy substitutions are, uh, our approach was to develop this uh, heuristic that we named DISH, or the Diet Improvement Ingredient Substitutability Heuristic. And uh, we made this heuristic by combining several metrics of both explicit and latex, latent semantics about ingredients uh, from several data sets. 
First, for latent semantics, uh, we mainly used some word embedding models. Uh, one word embedding model that was trained specifically on a large corpus of uh, recipe information, like the instructions and the ingredients that we use for those recipes. Now, on the other hand, for explicit semantics, uh, we wanted to try to use some more information about ingredient classification, as well as intuitively trying to capture the following two points. One, that good substitutions are likely to be paired together with similar ingredients, and that good substitutions are likely to be used in similar recipes. To be able to obtain these sort of explicit semantic information, we also largely leveraged uh, information that was found in a resource that we previously developed called the Food KG. Uh, so now I'll just be giving a brief overview of the food KG since it was uh, very important for our methods, both for trying to identify substitutions as well as uh, kind of considering the health aspects of uh, substitutions. So the food KG is a knowledge graph of recipes and linked data about ingredients uh, that was developed a couple of years ago by the Heels project. And it is based on the data from the recipe 1M plus project, which contains a data set of over a million recipes from various popular websites. On the right side, we can see a small depiction of the kind of information that's included in the food KG. So at the bottom, we have recipe, which has the ingredients that it uses, as well as the quantities of those ingredients. For each ingredient entity, we also have links to uh, two additional sources of information. First, uh, on the left side, we have a link to nutritional information that we obtained from the USDA. So for example, here we can see how unsalted butter has an equivalent entity in the USDA data. And from there, we're able to look at some aspects like how many calories it contains, how much sodium, et cetera. The second resource that we link it to is entities in Foodon. So Foodon is an ontology of ingredients and uh, more, more generally food and sort of classifications and relationships among different types of food products. So as we can see in this example, we have unsalted butter, which links to an equivalent entity of unsalted butter into Foodon ontology. And then that is a subclass of cow milk butter food product, which is a subclass of cow, uh, cow milk food product, et cetera. So using this information that's found in the food KG, we computed a couple of substitutability metrics uh, using the explicit semantics, as I mentioned earlier. So we can consider a recipe in the food KG, for example, when we see here for mashed potatoes, and this includes the ingredients of russet potatoes, unsalted butter, whole milk, garlic, and salt. Uh, the first metric that we tried to compute was similarity of uh, ingredient pairings or the distributional similarity of ingredients co-occurring together. So from this recipe, we would be able to look at ingredient pairings like russet potato with unsalted butter, russet potato with whole milk, etc. And we would use this sort of information to get a general idea of the similarity in the types of ingredients that other ingredients are paired together with in recipes in the food KG. A second metric of similarity that we tried to compute here was to capture our notion of ingredients being used in similar recipes. And for this, we uh, used positive pointwise mutual information. Uh, mutual information is a method that's uh, sometimes utilized in natural language processing applications. And intuitively, it kind of gives an idea of how meaningful it is uh, to see two pieces of information. So in our example here, how meaningful is it that we see the ingredient potato compared to the rest of the recipe of butter, whole milk, garlic, and salt? And to give a comparison, it probably would be more meaningful seeing potato in this kind of recipe compared to looking at whether salt occurs in this kind of recipe, because salt is used so broadly across so many other recipes, so it would contain less information there. And um, Additionally, uh, going back a slide real quick, as we can see in our links to the food on ontology, because we have some information about subclass information for ingredients, we also leverage this to help uh, better generalize the ingredients when we are trying to compute these similarity metrics. So going back here, if we're thinking about the ingredient pairings, rather than ju just looking at whether russet potato is paired together with unsalted butter, we can also uh, infer from this that then russet potato is paired together with a type of cow milk butter food product, and that is paired together with a type of cow milk based food product, et cetera, from the subclass relations that we could obtain from food on. And then using uh, 
these similarity metrics that we computed, as well as additional information from word embeddings and such, uh, this uh, image here depicts the general process that we used for trying to determine whether or not uh, substitutions were good for a particular ingredient and ranking them based on our uh, approach of computing a dish score. So here we have an example of a ingredient potatoes, and it starts off by first doing some filtering from uh, using information from the USDA and Foodon uh, to be able to first get rid of candidates that would be considered unhealthy for a particular user. So for example, if we're going with the running example of uh, trying to find substitutions for potatoes that are lower in carbohydrates, this filtering stage would get rid of any uh, candidates for substitutions that are higher in carbs. Once we have the candidate substitutions, uh, we plug that in to compute various uh, scores for similarity, such as the uh, recipe context similarity, the ingredient pairing similarity, and the similarity of the word embeddings that are generated for those ingredients uh, compared to all of those metrics for the target ingredient of potatoes. This eventually produces a score of substitutability for each of the um, plausible ingredients. And then finally, it produces a ranking of what we think might be good substitutions for the target ingredient. So as we can see in this example, uh, some of the top drink in, uh, ingredient substitutions for potato included turnip, squash, and cauliflower. Excuse me. So having developed our approach of um, computing a substitutability heuristic, we also tried to evaluate it. And one of the issues with uh, trying to evaluate the substitution work is that there isn't really any sort of widely accepted ground truth for substitutions, um, unlike many other, <coughs> excuse me again, unlike many other um, data sources that we generally use. And so we tried to evaluate it by um, extracting some substitution information that we could find from several web resources. So the first resource that we tried to use was called uh, the Cook's Thesaurus. This is a website that includes a large variety of information about ingredients as well as uh, common substitution options for those ingredients. And from this website, we just uh, ran web scrapers over it and collected a data set to evaluate against. Another data set that we used for evaluation was some food uh, food.com user review data. So um, in food.com reviews, people are oftentimes able to put comments about what they thought of the recipe or sometimes some modifications that they made to the recipe. For example, people saying, oh, instead of A, I used ingredient B, or instead of potatoes, I replaced it with cauliflower. And so we searched through uh, these user reviews to find those sorts of keywords and produced an additional data set based off of that. And we evaluated our method compared to some baselines, including just using uh, word embedding similarity or using some of the individual uh, similarity metrics that we computed for ingredients. And compared to these baselines, um, we were able to find that our dish heuristic was able to uh, show higher performance for identifying good substitutions for ingredients. My apologies. So what were some key takeaways that we were able to find from this work of trying to identify and rank substitutions? Well, the first was that we actually found that using uh, classifications for ingredients from food on was very helpful in helping to generalize the ingredients. Many of the recipes that were included in the food KG had uh, some ingredients that were either using uncommon names or they were used very rarely because they were a very specific variety of a more general ingredient. And this especially posed problematic when we were trying to look at the similarity of uh, how ingredients were paired together with other ingredients and recipes. But by using Foodon's classification, uh, for example, as we can see here, instead of just thinking about russet potatoes or red potatoes being used in recipes, we could generalize it more to being how a potato is used in a recipe or generalizing it even further to how a type of potato food product is used in recipe. And this helped very much with improving the performance of those metrics and getting some better insight into how ingredients are being used together. And additionally, um, we found that it was very beneficial to use uh, food KGN that 
explicit semantics that we could obtain from that resource, but the latent semantics that we could get from word embeddings also proved invaluable in our uh, heuristic. So for example, some qualitative properties about ingredients, such as uh, taste, texture, or how they are used in a recipe, these sorts of information wasn't uh, included in the food gauge, but they were sort of able to get captured in the latent uh, properties of the embeddings that were made by the word embedding models. And so using both the latent and explicit semantics together, we believe was able to help contribute positively to the performance of our method. Now, having said that, there are some important pieces of future work and some um, large limitations of the work that we did here within uh, exploring substitutions. And uh, most notably first was that we wanted to be able to work towards better defining and representing various forms of context uh, that are relevant to this task of ingredient substitutions. Uh, certain different sorts of recipes would have various contexts associated with them such as the cultural context of where the recipe originates from or the cuisine or the time of day that a recipe is most often eaten, such as breakfast versus dinner. And these sorts of contexts probably will impact um, what would be considered a good substitution for each of those. For example, in a Chinese recipe versus an Italian recipe, the types of uh, substitutions that you would consider good for a particular recipe probably would be different because of uh, different sorts of flavor profiles that those cultures might value more. Similarly, there's context about individuals that we need to work towards being able to represent better. This includes uh, contexts like preferences, uh, their dietary needs, so particularly what constitutes healthy for one user versus another, or even the context of uh, some company that they're eating their food together with. For example, if you're eating together with someone who has an allergy, you would need to consider the kinds of substitutions that would be good uh, to be able to eat together with that person with the allergy. In a related vein, um, together with being able to represent and use context in more meaningful ways, we also want to do more nuanced evaluation of substitutions. So as I mentioned before, different recipes from different cultures might have different ideas of what is actually a good substitution. And this sort of evaluation wasn't something that we were able to do in the scope of this work, but moving forward, we would want to try to capture some notion of that a little bit better. Uh, finally, we also want to place even more of an emphasis on being able to identify what is healthy for different users. And again, this would be using different forms of context about the user to determine, say, what sort of medical diagnoses the user has or some recent eating patterns of the user, which might uh, impact at any given time what is considered healthy versus unhealthy for them. And this sort of work going forward is also going to involve uh, more with trying to curate and represent guidelines for healthy food consumption. So this would include trying to look into patterns about uh, recent eating habits that the user has had or general um, medical recommendations for patients that, for example, have diabetes versus patients with other conditions. Now, having mentioned this sort of future work, um, I also would like to discuss some related work that is being conducted as part of the HEALS project that kind of um, has some relations to the work that I did in this case of ingredient substitutions versus the broader goal of heels of kind of um, more general improvement of user health. So one of the works uh, that has been done that actually also used the food KG resource is uh, trying to make a representation of recipes in vector space. So this work that was conducted last year uh, called Receptor basically used um, a neural network model to take in the recipe instructions as well as ingredients and some tag information that was uh, collected from food.com to embed uh, recipes into vector space. And this was uh, especially useful in what we were trying to do with heels of uh, some recommendations of recipes. So for example, if a user has a particular recipe that they like, this model maybe would be able to embed it into vector space and make it so that it would be fairly easy to be able to recommend another recipe by just looking at the similarity of vectors. And the work that we did here of trying to identify certain ingredients that are healthy or suggesting substitutions for it could also pro uh, provide impactful here because after uh, suggesting a particular recipe, we also could look into the health aspects of it. And if something seems like a very good recommendation uh, that a user would like, but is just a little bit unhealthy in some particular aspect, 
maybe we could integrate the sort of work of suggesting a small change that could be made to that recipe, perhaps an ingredient substitution, uh, to help make it more suited to the user while also trying to maintain this aspect of recommending recipes that we think that the user would like to eat very much. Um, another related piece of work is using these sort of explicit semantics that are included in a resource like the food gaugey to be able to explain health aspects better. So there's been some work that, again, was conducted last year by other members of the HEALS project for representations of explanations, uh, particularly an ontology for explaining, ontology for explanations, explaining explanations. Um, and this sort of work is uh, very helpful to work towards developing more interpretable results uh, that are using knowledge-driven methods. So if I want to say, be suggesting a substitution to a user, it probably would also be helpful if I'm explaining why I'm making that substitution. For example, you have diabetes and we want to be limiting your carbohydrate intake. Potatoes are an ingredient that are high in carbs. Therefore, you should do this substitution. These sort of explanations are uh, integral to trying to help motivate people to uh, change their eating habits. And as some other presentations earlier have described, um, this aspect of trying to provide different explanations to different users that are most suited to them is also helpful for trying to improve and understand their general health. And finally, another piece of uh, work that is being conducted at Heels is trying to represent and capture personal knowledge a little bit better. Uh, one of the ways that we've been trying to do this is by developing uh, what we call personal health knowledge graphs. So trying to represent knowledge and context about people as well as their health in a knowledge graph format. This uh, relates very closely to the aspect of context that I mentioned earlier. So being able to look into the context about a person or information surrounding that person and generally being able to use this context in a more meaningful way to be able to help suggest different types of foods that are best suited to a user's health. And uh, just to do some quick advertising, there also will be an upcoming workshop on this that is uh, run by people that are related to the Heels Project at the Knowledge Graph Conference that is going to be happening this May. So anyone who's interested in that can also join there. And uh, yeah, now I guess that I'll be trying to wrap up. So in conclusion, uh, with our work for trying to identify ingredient substitutions, we were able to see that the use of both latent and explicit semantics about ingredients, uh, both from word embedding models, as well as a knowledge graph that captured uh, nutrition and classification information about ingredients, were both very useful for the task of trying to identify substitutions. With that being said, there is very uh, a large amount of important work that remains to be done to capture some important aspects about health, context, and generally what is a good substitution. And we're hoping for uh, success and future work towards integrating these sort of methods that we used here, as well as knowledge-driven and machine learning approaches together to provide greater patient support to be able to improve uh, user health more generally. Um, and just for a quick acknowledgement, this work was partially supported by IBM Research AI through the AI Horizons Network. And uh, thank you, that concludes my talk. And I hope it was uh, I hope it was useful. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really impressed um, with the work you you just presented. Uh, we have also several questions. Um, the first one is the question um, regarding food on. Uh, what was actually the matching uh, percentage of the ingredients to food on? How well you know are they covered by food on? Yeah. So um, regarding the accuracy there. So if this is a question regarding like how accurate were the connections, I don't think that there is a clear number on that for the food KG just because there were a very large number of ingredients. Um, and I want to say off the top of my head that um, probably over 90% of the ingredients in the food KG were linked to some ingredient in food on. Um, but with that being said, uh, it is a little bit unclear um, how good the granularity of some of those connections were. So, for mm -hmm. example, if a recipe um, that's in Food Gigi has like 
diced tomatoes and sliced tomatoes and cubed tomatoes and so on. There are a lot of uh, ways that people could express different ingredients with uh, some slightly different modifiers. Sometimes those weren't extremely meaningful, but other times maybe they were. And so the exact level of uh, how granular each of those matches were is uh, a little bit unclear. Mm -hmm. Okay. It means that uh, we still have a lot of work uh, to be done in this field, uh, which is, uh, which yes, is good. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Another um, more common than question is uh, coming from Elena. Uh, she's suggesting that uh, maybe you should add in context uh, also the chemical need um, in the recipe for an ingredient. For example, eggs can be used in a recipe for different properties. So chemistry to be included as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, those those sorts of functional properties of ingredients, uh, we definitely did consider trying to include that. And that example of eggs uh, being able to provide certain properties is also important, say in like a baking recipe. If you use mm -hmm. eggs, it can be helpful for providing structure, or like bonding the ingredients together. This wasn't something that we investigated too deeply. And we know that there are some resources out there that have um, information about chemical properties and chemical compounds included for ingredients. But in our uh, early attempts of trying to use those sorts of resources, we found that they weren't able to help too much with uh, this task of trying to identify substitutions, mm -hmm. at least at this point. Agree. Um, maybe the last question. Um, um, how, how could you relate uh, your work to um, people with special nutritional needs. Um, you are talking mainly about a uh, healthy population, but um, would it be possible to extend your work also to people with special needs, for instance, with food uh, intolerance or, or allergies or other uh, medical conditions? Yeah, so I absolutely think that it could. And actually that uh, point about like food intolerance or allergies to specific types of ingredients I think actually can be done fairly easily in um, what we already have with the work. So in the filtering that we did for uh, trying to identify whether or not some candidate ingredients were good, if we were able to um, represent this information about the person that they are, <coughs> ah, my apologies again, uh, that they're intolerant to this particular ingredient or have an allergy to this, uh, say, specific type of nut or something, we could do this sort of filtering together with uh, the taxonomy of foods from food on to uh, get rid of those kind of suggestions in the first place or uh, check the original recipe and look into whether or not it contains those sorts of uh, different classes of ingredients. So yes, I think that uh, the point in that question definitely is possible and uh, is something that we're looking into for future work of being able to identify those sorts of uh, different limitations that we would need to be applying to uh, make the substitutions healthy and good for a particular user. Mm. Yeah, and um, let's say really the last one because we are uh, time limited. Uh, Janine um, is asking uh, why word amending what the other uh, machine learning um, most probably approaches. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, why word amending? Is that why word embeddings? Most probably, or, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm confused so, um, as well, yeah, but this is the question. <laughs> I, I, will, I will assume that it's um, word embeddings with the other methods. So with word embeddings, um, we mainly use that because uh, there were a lot of uh, properties about um, ingredients that we didn't have any sort of explicit labels for to be able to use. And word embeddings generally have shown uh, some pretty good uh, uses for being able to kind of latently capture similarity between um, certain words that are used together in certain contexts. And the words that we were interested in here were um, in recipes, the sorts of cooking methods that were applied to ingredients, I think helps to give some notion of um, capturing how the ingredients are typically used. For example, if potatoes are used in a lot of recipes and occur very often with the word mash, that's going to be slightly indicative of how a potato is used. And if we're looking at other recipes and cauliflowers are also something that are oftentimes used with the word mash. This sort of information that we're able to latently capture from word embeddings, I think, 
uh, was something that we wanted to try to investigate and whether or not that could be used together with the more explicit information from the Fugeji. So thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much uh, for your presentation and also this discussion. Um, I wish you all the best with your PhD. Um, and uh, yeah, now is coming the break. Um, and after that, we continue with, yep. with the day, big day. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.